Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in today. You know that this message that you're about to hear, I pray that not only inspires you, but encourages you to follow Jesus even more. In fact, there are probably people in your life who need to hear this timely word. Chances are you're thinking about them right now. Share this message with them at this very moment. And if you're watching us on YouTube, make sure that you hit the subscribe button. I also want to take a moment and thank those who support us. We wouldn't have a ministry outside of these four walls if it weren't for people like you who come alongside us in prayer and support us financially. There are thousands of people who are benefited by this ministry and because of that, we want to say thank you so much for your generosity. To continue or to even start supporting our mission to help others and their families follow Jesus, you can give by visiting cfmiami.org slash give. Well, enjoy the sermon. And I, I hope that you love what you just said. That you have a God who fights for you. And even when you were so far away from Him, even when you didn't want nothing to do with God, listen, He loved you, He was fighting for you, and today, amen, you're walking in fellowship with God. Let's go praise God today, amen. Amen. Hey, well, welcome everyone. It is so great to worship alongside of you. My name is Omar and I have the honor and the privilege of serving as lead pastor here at CF. And uh, today we are continuing uh, our, uh, our new series called uh, Man of Wars, a study through the book of Joshua. And so today we're going to be looking at a chapter 2 about a, uh, a girl. We're going to be studying a, a girl named Rahab. And so listen, I'm ready and excited to dive into God's Word. I hope you are as well at all of our local campuses and also online. And so if you have Bibles, let's go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. And uh, you can follow along with me as I read, okay? Let's do what God's Word says. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. And they went and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was, what? Rahab, and lodged there. In other words, God sent these two spies to the unlikeliest of person, a girl named Rahab, amen? That is God's word. You can go into casino, everybody at all campuses. Again, it's good to have you here with us on this Memorial Day weekend, and let me start off by sharing this with you. You know, when I was growing up, there were a lot of different uh, popular bands, and one of those bands had to be the band Korn. How many of you, by any chance, remember the band Korn? They're still around, sort of. Yeah. And if you remember, as a young man who was early in my walk with the Lord, right, Korn was one of those bands that seemed to be kind of like the opposite of the things of God, right? Kind of just very far from God. And I feel like everyone who listened and was involved in that culture, it seemed like everyone involved in the culture was not only in a dark place, but also just very far from God. And folks, if the people who listened to the music and was involved in that culture, if they were far from God, then the band members themselves were even in a darker place and even further from God. And folks, a good example of that is Brian Welch, who was the lead guitarist uh, for Korn. And folks, not only was he known for his world-class guitar skills, but he was also well-known for his reckless, immoral, and really high drug abuse life. And so people knew who Brian Welch was. Now folks, follow me here. Because about 13 years ago, Brian Welch put out a video online that shocked everyone who watched it and was familiar with the band. In fact, take a look at this video. So in my head, I was like, okay, I'm gonna accept Christ in front of everybody right now. Then I'm gonna go home and snort drugs until I don't wanna do them anymore. And that was my way of thinking. So I received Christ at the church. I went home, neglected my daughter and put her in front of the TV. I remember I grabbed a $100 bill. I always used a $100 bill for some reason, pride or something. I chopped up my crystal meth. 
got it all smooth and powdery and I snorted a big old line and I held the bill and I looked up and I said, Jesus, if you're real like that pastor said, then you gotta take these drugs from me. Come into my life, come into my heart. And I just got quiet. I said, search me right now, search my heart. And I stayed silent and I said, you know I wanna quit. You know I wanna be a good dad for this kid. She lost her mother to drugs and she's gonna lose me if I don't quit, amen. My uh, real estate broker, Eric, he, uh, he said, Brian, I don't mean to be weird with you. I, I hope you don't take this the wrong way, but I, f I felt the scripture like jump out at me. I've never done this before, you know, so I don't really know how to do this, but I felt like this would mean something to you. It's Matthew 11, 28, come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. I remember all tweaked out. I looked up in the dictionary, weary. I looked up burdened, and I just I pulled the scripture apart. And I was like, oh, I'm, I'm weary and burdened, and I need rest for my soul. And uh, I didn't know if it was real, but the, you know, they invited me to church a couple couple weeks later, and. I received Christ. Jesus, you gotta take these drugs from me. Search me right now, search my heart. Father, I felt so much fatherly love from, from heaven. And it was like, I don't condemn you. I love you, I love you. It was just love, love. And instantly, that love from God came into me. It was so powerful that the next day I threw away all my drugs and uh, I quit corn. I was like, I'm quitting corn and I'm gonna raise my kid because my kid, like I got the love from God coming to me and then it came out of me to my kid. It changed me, my heart was changed like that. And I was like, Janaya, daddy's gonna be home with you all the time. I'm quitting my career. And her face lit up and she's like, for me? You know, she felt so special and uh, God used her to save me, to save her life later on. Amen. Praise God. Amen. And folks, the reason that that video was so shocking to everyone who was familiar with the band and with Brian Welsh is because for so many people, they viewed Brian Welsh as simply unsavable. Sure, in our minds, we knew that anybody can be saved, right? But, but in practical terms, when we saw him, when we knew who he was involved with, for many people, they viewed Brian Welsh as just simply unsavable. He's just, it's just too far from God. He's just too much in a dark place. Brian Welsh just seems unsavable. And folks, let me just bring that over to our teaching for today because family, what an example of how some of us may see certain people in this world. And by that I mean that just like I viewed Brian Welch as someone just as unsavable, that they were just too far from the grace of God. Just like that, and here's the main idea for today as we open up the scriptures. There might be some people in your life that you view as unsavable. Sure, in your mind, right, you know what the scripture says, that anybody can be saved. But really, in practical terms, when you see them, in your mind, they're just too far from God. And it may not have to be a rock band uh, artist, right? It could, be, it could be anybody in your life. Maybe for you, it's a close family member. Maybe it's a mom or dad. Maybe it's a cousin, or an uncle, a nephew. For some of us, it's perhaps uh, that person at work that you have to deal with every day. For some of us, it's that neighbor that every time we go outside and we look down to the other house, we see them and we think, wow, they're just, they're just too far from God. For some of us, it's every time we go to Publix or Starbucks and we see them and the way they look and the way they act and the way they carry themselves, they just seem like they are unsavable. So the question is, who is that in your life? 
that in your mind, you know, they're just, they're just too far from the grace of God. They're just too set in their ways, too, uh, too hard-headed, too far. Who is that in your life? You may be sitting here thinking, you know, Omar, man, I, 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 I can think of a few people like that in my life. But, you know, I don't want to view them that way. I want to believe that God's grace is stronger than any of the resistance. I, I know that God has a plan. That God, God could do anything. So, Omar, what do we need to know from God's word to remind ourselves that no one is too far from God's grace? Amen. We're going to find out today from Joshua chapter 2, all right, and a girl named Rahab. So if you have your Bible, just go ahead and turn to Joshua chapter 2 at all of our local campuses, Doral, Coral Gables, West Kendall, Redlin, and even everyone online. And today I have three important thoughts for us to consider. Christ Fellowship, are you ready to dive into God's Word? Yeah? On this Memorial Day weekend? Amen. So write this down as point number one. Here's the first thing we need to remember. That God shows grace to the unlikeliest of people. The folks, listen to what God's Word says in Joshua chapter 2, verse 1. It says, And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent two men secretly from Shittim as spies, saying, Go view the land, especially Jericho. The church stopped right there and slipped into the scene for just a moment. Because like we learned last week, Moses had now passed away, and now Joshua was the leader of the people of Israel. And Scripture says that all of Israel's heart was as close to Joshua as they were to Moses, right? And so Joshua now is the leader of the people of Israel. And not only was he a spiritual leader, in fact, throughout the God's Word, uh, he is one of the few people in Scripture that something negative is never said about Joshua. So that's a, and he must have been a, a great man of God, but also he was a very important military leader. In fact, he was a man of war. And so Joshua, knowing that he has to lead the people of Israel militarily, right, he sends, before they cross over into the Jordan, he sends two spies over the Jordan to go scope out the land, especially the city called Jericho. In fact, let me just give you a visual of where we're at in the story, right? And so if we can put up the, the, the map, yeah. So right now they're encamped in Shittim, the plains of Moab. And so they have not crossed the Jordan yet, right? So he sent two spies. They go start, they start, you know, serving the land. What's the land look like? What are the ditches? What are the places? And he says, make sure you stop and explore and spy out Jericho. Now, here's why Jericho was so important. Let me just take the time to explain what's going on in that city. See, Jericho was the most important city, the Canaanite city in the Jordan Valley. Uh, first of all, it was an important religious city. Uh, it was a center of the worship of the goddess named Ashtoreth, um, which, you know, involved a lot of immorality, uh, sexual uh, worship, worship acts, and all these different things. And so it was not only a center of uh, religious immorality to pagan deities, uh, but also, it was an important military city uh, for the land of Canaan. And the reason for that, it was because it was the most secure city in all of the land of Canaan. You see, we're going to learn in a few weeks from now that they were very famous for having these really high, formidable, uh, impenetrable walls. In fact, we're going to learn how the way in a few weeks, that the way that the, built, the, the walls were constructed was such an angles in such a way that really it was virtually impossible for an enemy to ever infiltrate inside of the city. So if you're going to be Jericho, you have to be outside of the city. You can never enter into the city. And so which means that if the people of God could not, listen carefully, could not defeat Jericho, they were dead in the water. They were not going to be able to conquer the remainder of the land. And so just as we read, right, Joshua sends two spies to scope out Jericho and listen to what happens next. He says, and they went, and they went, the spies, and came into the house of a prostitute whose name was Rahab and lodged there. Now, church, this may seem, okay, like an insignificant detail in the story, but it's actually a very significant moment, not only in the conquest of the land, 
But we're going to see that it's a very significant moment theologically for the rest of Scripture, okay? We're going to come back to that later on in the message. But for right now, what I want to draw your attention to is the grace that God had on this girl named Rahab. Now, folks, think about this. Out of all the thousands of people that were living in the, in the city of Jericho, who, which, by the way, in just a few days, they were destined to receive the judgment of God. All those people were going to be destroyed in just a matter of a few days, right? God put in the heart of Joshua to send two spies to go scope of the land. He didn't have to do that. But for whatever reason, God led Joshua to send two spies. And then those two spies, out of the thousands of households that they could have stopped in the city of Jericho, they stopped in the place of a girl named Rahab. And folks, here's why this is important. First of all, she was a Canaanite, pagan, idol worshiper. No doubt in her, li in her life, in her home, in her life, she was consumed with being a pagan idol worshiper and involved in all the ritualistic acts of that time. Second of all, uh, not only was she a pagan idol worshiper, she was also a woman, which in those, in those days, right, a man had a higher standing in society than a woman, right? But God sent the spies to a pagan worshiper, idol worshiper, who was a woman. And on top of that, she was not, just not an ordinary woman. She was a prostitute. Now, folks, we cannot just quickly just move on from that word. We need to stop and remember and really understand who she was. No doubt there was a girl who every single day she had men over. And these men had her way with her. And they would pay her to do sexual acts every day. And most likely, since Ashereth, right, was a pagan deity who a lot of times was worshipped through, uh, through sexual acts involving prostitutes. She was very involved in that world. And so we can never really just minimize really what Rahab used to do day in and day out, right? And then here's why I, I mention all this. You would think that if God was sending somebody into the land, that the spies would maybe... Uh, go to the home of a man who was very moral, right? Who was looked upon as a, as a good person. Yeah, he might not know the one true God, right? He was, at the end of the day, a Gentile, uh, a pagan, but he was at least a good moral man who did his best and treated people right and didn't do certain things, right? You would think that God would send the spies to someone like that, but no, he sent her, he sent the spies to a young girl whose name was Rahab, who was a prostitute. And folks, this was to display God's grace. Amen. You see, this is an example of God's sovereign grace over a sinner. In fact, listen to what John Owen, the great Puritan, listen to what he writes about Rahab. And I want you to read carefully what he says. He says this. John, uh, John Owen says, Rahab is a blessed example of both the sovereignty of God's grace and of its power, of its freedom and sovereignty, and the calling and conversion of a person given up through her choices to the vilest of sins. Nobody, listen carefully, nobody, no sin should ever lead to despair when the cure of God's sovereign, almighty grace is engaged. In other words, listen, when God begins to exercise his grace on someone, listen, he has freedom to exercise his grace on whoever and, who, and whoever, regardless of what they have done. And no matter what they've done in the past, no, no, no matter what their lifestyle is, no matter what sins they've committed, no matter what they've done to other people, it does not matter. When God's grace is engaged... It does not matter what they've done. When God's grace has overcome into a person's life, 
Listen carefully. There's nothing that they can do from experiencing the love and the grace and choosing of God. Amen? This is what we call irresistible grace. It doesn't matter who you are and what you've done. God's grace is irresistible. Listen, it will come all obstacles in order to bring you to himself. Can we praise God today for that? Amen? And folks, as we go back to the passage, right, we don't have time to read every single verse in the narrative. But you, if we read verse 2 to 7, we see that the men of Jericho realize there are some people in Rahab's home. So they come searching, and Rahab had hidden them on the roof and tells them, listen, they're not here. They left. Go search them. You'll find them out in the open country. They went. They deceived them, and they never found them, right? So, so Rahab really just hid uh, the spies during that time. But folks, here's what we're going to find out from this story. Write this down as big number two. That God saves the unlikeliest of people through their faith. Amen. Now folks, listen to what it says a few verses later. It says, before the men lay down, she came up to them on the roof and said to them, I know that the Lord has given you the land. And that the fear of you has fallen upon us. And that all the inhabitants of the land melt away before you. For we have heard how the Lord. Now, circle the word Lord for just a moment. Because the word Lord there, as you can tell, right? It's all capitalized, right? It's in your Bibles. It should be capital L, then lowercase O-R-D. And I've mentioned to you in the past, a few months ago, if you were here, how whenever you read capital L-O-R-D, lowercase, it's not just the general word for God. It's actually the translation of the personal name of God, Yahweh, right? And so whenever you see that, it means actually not Lord in general, but the word Yahweh, which is a personal name of God. And so listen to what Rahab says. She says, for we have heard how Yahweh, how Yahweh dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to those two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you devoted to destruction. And as soon as we heard it, our hearts melted, and there was no spirit left in any man because of you. And folks, here's the most important verse out of this entire chapter. For the Lord, for Yahweh, your God, he is God. He is God in the heavens above and on the earth beneath. You see, spiritually, Rahab was not in the ideal circumstances to come to, know, to, come to faith in the one true God, right? Remember, she was part of a corrupt, depraved culture far from God. She never heard the teachings of Moses. She never heard the law. She never heard Joshua speak, right? She had never heard anything. All she knew was that this God, Yahweh, has done all these great acts, and therefore he must be the one true God. Not Ashereth, not Baal, but Yahweh. He is the one true God. And folks, it was at this juncture, it's almost like scales fell off from her eyes, and she began to realize that God is the one true God. And folks, this was the moment of faith for Rahab. In fact, listen to what the book of Hebrews says in chapter 11, verse 31, which I always like to remind you. Hallelujah. Scripture's best commentary is not a book that you buy or going online. Scripture's best commentary is Scripture itself. And so whenever you see another part of the Bible, like the New Testament, refer to something in the Old Testament, pay attention. That is what God is trying to Focus on, to help you focus. So listen to what it says in the New Testament about Rahab. It says, by what, church family? Faith. Faith. We could do better than that. What is it? Faith. Yeah, by faith. Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. You see, it is through her faith in the one true God that she became part of the people of God. In fact, her faith 
was so strong that she was one of the, of, the, uh, of the only two women that were mentioned in the Hall of Faith in Hebrews chapter 11. One of them was Sarah, Abraham's wife, and the other was Rahab. And you see, folks, she was, became part of the people of God by faith and faith alone. And folks, nothing has changed in thousands of years. The way people become part of the people of God, that they had a relationship with the Lord, that they can be forgiven of their sins, that they can uh, uh, know the one true God, is by faith and by faith alone. It's not by rituals. It's not by traditions. It's not by you coming to church and sitting in a church service. Listen carefully. You can do all those things for the rest of your life and never know God. There has to be a moment in your life where you put your full trust, faith, and surrender in the Lord Almighty. Can I get an amen to that? Now, some may argue, here's what some may argue. Some may say, well, wasn't also Rahab saved by her works? And what they usually quote is James chapter 2, which says, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she, was rece when she received the messengers and sent them out another way? Now, you always have to keep in mind what was James trying to accomplish in this letter. You see, James was helping people understand that at the end of the day, even though faith is what saves us, faith and faith alone is what saves us, according to the rest of Scripture, the actions and the decisions that we make either confirm or not confirm whether or not we truly have faith in the Lord. Amen? You know, it's not really the perfection of your life, but it's the direction of your life. And so notice Rahab did not only believe in the one true God there and found refuge in the one true God, but her bold actions confirm her faith. And folks, it's the same way with us. Listen, in our lives, listen, if you say that you are a believer in Christ, if you say that you are a Christian, then your actions, your decisions, the way you live your life should confirm that you are a true believer in Christ. And again, listen, it's not the perfection of your life. No one's perfect. I'm not perfect. But here's what I'm trying to say. What, what Scripture teaches us. The moment that you come to faith in the Lord, right, and you give your life to the Lord, and you start walking with the Lord, there should be a change. There should be the way your mentality changes, your love changes, the way you uh, seek the Lord changes, the decisions that you make changes. Everything starts changing in your life. You don't become perfect, but things start to change. And folks, it's important for us to, to understand that because it's easy for people to self-deceive themselves to say, I, I'm a believer in Christ, yet their life hasn't changed. They still have not changed. They do the same things. There's no love for God. Nothing has changed in your life. And as a result, they end up self-deceiving themselves when God really knows what's going on in their heart. Because listen, when a person comes to know Christ, listen, they don't become perfect. I'm not perfect. No one's perfect. But there's a change of desires in the heart of a child of God. Can I get an amen to that? Yeah. And so going back to the passage, you know, when she's talked to the spies in, in, in her roof, you know, she had one request for them. And listen to what she tells them next. It says, now then, please swear to me by the Lord, by Yahweh, that as I have dealt kindly with you, you also will deal kindly with my father's house and give me a sure sign that you will save alive my father and mother, my brothers and sisters, and all who belong to them, and deliver our lives from death. And the men said to her, our life for yours even to death. If you do not tell this business of ours, then when the Lord gives us the land, we will deal kindly and faithfully with you. And folks, as we're going to learn in two weeks, the moment that Israel defeats Jericho, the spies and Joshua were faithful to Rahab, and they brought her with her entire family, and they were saved from the judgment on those people. And from that point, listen carefully, her life was never the same. But folks, here is why this story in Joshua chapter 2 
has such significant, profound theological importance for you and me today. And here's why. Write this down as big number two at all campuses. It's because God uses the unlikeliest people to reveal his glory. Amen? And folks, here's what I mean by that. You see, God chose Rahab to showcase and reveal the future glory of the gospel. In fact, you may not realize this, but Rahab is the first Gentile, non-Jewish person is what Gentile means, the first Gentile in Scripture ever to be converted and become part of the people of God. She was a very first Gentile. So in a sense, she was a foreshadowing, a picture of the church. You think about it, Rahab is not much different than you and me. Most of us are Gentiles. We're not Jewish people by ethnicity, right? But, and we, at one point, were far from God. We were, had things in our life that we were not believers in the one true God, but something happened in our life, right, that at one point in our life, God showed grace to us and that by faith, we became part of the people of God. You see, Rahab was a foreshadowing of the church, was a foreshadowing, a picture of every single one of us. And listen, in fact, this is one of the great mysteries of the message of the gospel. In fact, listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 6. It says, this what, church family at all campuses? Mystery. What is it? Mystery. Yeah, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. You see, before, everyone thought that the only people who could be part of the people of God were people that, were ethnic, uh, that their ethnicity was, was, uh, was Jewish. But the mystery of the gospel, right, is that as Christ came down on this earth, right, to die for us since when he died on a cross, he made a way for all people groups to be part of the people of God. See, this was a mystery. And so what happens is, what, 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 what the Apostle Paul is, is helping us understand here is that no matter who you are, no matter how far away you are from God, no matter what nationality, no matter what your lifestyle is, no matter what you have done, no matter how old you are, no matter what color of your skin, it does not matter. Every single person on earth through faith in Christ could become part of the people of God. Can we praise God today for that? And I love it because not only Rahab did she become part of the people of God through faith, all right, she also became part of a royal lineage. In fact, listen to the genealogy in Matthew chapter 1. It says, And Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed, the father of Jesse, and Jesse, the father of David the king. So, folks, here's what I want you to draw your attention. I want to give you a visual of this, right? So what we see here, right, is that when Rahab, right, became part of the people of God, she eventually married a man whose name was Salmon in the tribe of Judah. You see, there were 12 tribes among the people of Israel. Judah was one of the tribes. So she ends up becoming part of the people of God, and her and Salmon meet and they get together, and they get married. And then they have a son whose name was Boaz. Now, if you have read the book of, script, the book of Ruth, Boaz is the one who eventually marries Ruth. And we're going to cover that, that, this book a little further down the road later on this year. And so Boaz, in an older age, marries a girl named Ruth. And they have a child, right? And after that, uh, they have a child whose name was Obed. And then Obed eventually has a son named Jesse. And then Jesse has a son whose name was David, who turns out to be the king of Israel. 
And what's amazing about this is that Rahab, this Gentile prostitute, right, now becomes the great-great-grandmother of David, the king of Israel, a man after God's own heart. And then if you keep going down the lineage, you know that eventually David is the ancestor of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And so what's amazing about this, this story is that Rahab is the ancestral mother of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Isn't that amazing? And we praise God for that. Now, it's interesting that some right, try to argue in the past, in church history, well, the word for prostitute there in Joshua is not really prostitute like we know prostitute, right? It doesn't mean that. And, and they're trying to do, they're trying to keep the lineage of, of Jesus pure, right? They're, they're trying to keep it morally pure. But you see, God specifically showed grace to this girl named Rahab to show that nobody is too far from God's grace. And listen carefully. Yeah, and listen carefully. And that even a prostitute Gentile girl is in the lineage of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, her future descendant would die on a cross for her. What a beautiful thought, amen? That, that God has shown us, has given this, this privilege to understand who this girl was to understand the far-reaching effects of the glorious cross. Can we praise God today for that, amen? And folks, let me end with this. You know, some of us maybe walked in and here in one of our campuses, and the reality is that you feel just so distant from God. You know, you may not be Rahab, but you just feel distant from God. You have done things in your life that you're not proud of, that you're ashamed of, that you've, seen, you've stumbled so many times, you've made so many mistakes. And you just feel weary. You feel heavy laden. You may have a facade over your face right now. God sees through that facade. He sees your heart. If you're feeling that way, let me remind you of the verse that Brian Welsh said at the beginning. Jesus said to us, listen, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I will give you rest for your souls. See, when you come to know Christ, say, when you put your faith in Christ, listen, that's the way that you can become a child of God. In fact, Scripture says this in John chapter 1, verse 12. It says this, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, who surrendered, who put their faith and trust in Christ, to them he gave the right to become children of God. See, there's something beautiful that happens that the moment that you put your faith and trust in what Jesus has done for you at the cross, how he died for your sins, for all of your sins, and he resurrected to new life, when there come a point of faith and surrender to the Lord, the Bible says that first of all, he forgives you of all of your sin. Everything you walked into to church today with that you feel so burdened about, you feel like, man, I've done, listen, he knew you were going to do that. He still died for you. He forgives you. And then at the moment of faith, here's what happens. He then comes and he adopts you as a son and daughter. You become a child of the living God. Just like Rahab through faith became part of the people of God, just like that. Listen, through faith, you become part of the people of God. And now you have a relationship with the Lord. Now you're walking with the Lord. He is yours and you are his. And for the rest of your life, you're not only going to have a God who leads you through every season in life, you can rest assured that at the end of your life, when you breathe your last breath here on earth, you will see the Lord and spend, be with him for all eternity. That's the promise that God gives us. So you see, there has to be a moment in your life, listen, where you put your trust in Christ, where you surrender your life. The question is, will you put your faith and trust in Christ today? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, as we reflect on this, this 
amazing story of Rahab. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you've made a way for all of us to be part of your people, to be your children, to be forgiven of your sins. Thank you, Lord, of the beautiful mystery of the gospel. And with all, the, with, with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, for those of us here today at all our campus that you feel, you know what, man, I, I'm tired of being far away from God. I need God in my life. I'm ready, I, I need to get right with God. I want, I want a relationship with the Lord. I say, if that's you, if you are ready, I'm going to lead you in a few moments in a prayer. And the words I'm going to lead you in, listen, it's not a poem, it's not a script. It's just helping you talk to God. But let me always remember this. When you pray, if that's you, what's saving you, it's not the words. It's the faith behind the words. So when you pray, listen, you don't pray to me. You pray to the, I'm just a man, I cannot save you. You pray to the God who loves you and gave his son to die on a cross for you. So if that's you, pray this quietly to yourself and pray to God. Pray this with me. Lord, today, Lord, I realize that no one is too far from you. And Lord, I need you in my life. So today, Lord, I come before you and I confess all of my sin. I ask you for forgiveness of sin, oh Lord. I put my faith in you. I surrender my life, oh Lord. And for the rest of my life, Lord, help me to live a life that honors you, God. I won't be perfect, but Lord, help me to live a life that starts honoring you, Lord, as I walk with you. Thank you, Lord, for saving me. I love you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray, and all of God's people say, amen. <laughs>